After leaving slavery in Egypt, the children of Israel tabernacled with God amidst the majestic rocks and mountains that surrounded Mount Sinai. By a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, God led his people eastward in their march to the promised land. As they followed the Lord in the way he led them, the way before them became not easier, but more difficult. This is a mystery too complex for words that God in leading his children to their place of purpose never leads them the easy way. There's a story about a man who was watching a logger at work. In the old days, they called them lumberjacks. One of the jobs of the lumberjack was to inspect the trees that had been cut and were sent down the river to the sawmill to be turned into lumber. The lumberjack would stand there with his sharp hook and separate the trees as they floated downstream. When somebody asked him why he did this, the lumberjack said, these trees may all look alike to you, but I can recognize that a few of them are quite different. The ones I let pass, are from trees that grew in the valley where they were always protected from the storms and their grain is rather rough and coarse. But the ones I hook and keep apart are the ones that I can tell came from high up on the mountains. Just by looking at them I can tell that from the time they were small trees they were beaten by strong winds. From the time they were small trees they've been battered by difficult storms. I can look at them and tell because you see those storms toughen the trees and gives them a fine grain and those are the trees we save and set aside for the best lumber and for choice work. Those trees that have weathered the most brutal storms, he said, are too good to be used for ordinary lumber. Maybe one day we'll be able to talk to our Savior and he'll explain the mystery to us. Why in leading his children and leading us to our place of purpose, he never led us the easy way. The children of Israel saw that the path God had led them on seemed to be leading them to a rocky wasteland and to a stark and desolate wilderness. The Bible called it a land full of deserts and pits, a land of drought and shadow. You find that in Jeremiah 2, 6. Neither said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through all a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed, through and where no man dwelt. Sometimes it will feel like and seem like that that's the way God is leading your life. Through deserts and pits, through dearth and shadow. As they traveled, we are told that after three days, some among the Israelites began to complain about the difficulties they faced in their journey. The complaint started first, as they always do, with those who were on the lookout for something to complain about. You know, even in the church, there are people who are always on the lookout for something to complain about. The Bible calls them murmurers and complainers. Sometimes their criticism and complaining comes in the strident chorus of protest. Other times it comes in the quiet mumbling that goes on in a church pew. I hate to tell you that there will always be people who, while you're trying to listen to the sermon in church, will start mumbling criticisms under their breath and try to distract you from the very blessing God wants you to have. And what's so amazing to me is that like the rest of the children of Israel, the murmurers and complainers, they complain while seeing the mighty hand of God at work. They are incorrigible. Those among the children of Israel who complained, they too saw the miracles God performed to rescue them from Pharaoh's bondage, and still they complained. They too saw the Red Sea parted, and still they complained. They saw Pharaoh's army drown in the Red Sea. They saw God bring water out of a rock, and still they complain. That tells me that there are some people in the household of faith. You will never be able to satisfy them. They refuse to be corrected. My favorite writer says that because the children of Israel were not pleased with the direction God was leading them, 
they were continually finding fault and taking it out on Moses. And like a virus, their murmuring and complaining began to spread. Did you know that dissatisfaction and criticism is contagious? And if you go around those kind of people, when they sneeze, you'll catch it. Murmuring and complaining is so contagious that it soon spread throughout the whole nation of Israel. You see, God had been feeding them manna from heaven, and they began to complain and criticize the miracle food of manna God was feeding them from heaven. During their slavery in Egypt, they had to make do with all the simple food. And they didn't realize it, said the Lord, that they had grown stronger than the Egyptians because of their simple diet. The Egyptians ate the steak. They ate the leftovers, the leeks and onions and garlics. They thought they were being deprived when in the truth of the matter was that they were eating the best stuff. They were eating the food that all, had all the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. The scraps that were being thrown to them had everything the food needs, the body needs to boost your immune system. But the Bible tells us that in this spirit of complaining and criticism, the children of Israel began to cry out for meat and flesh to eat. They're in the wilderness. These ungrateful people began telling the Lord they didn't like what was on his menu every day. Numbers 11.4 says, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. We remember those, but... We want the meat. But look at us now. Our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all to eat except this tasteless tofu stuff uh, called manna. But God did not give them meat and flesh food because he knew it was not good for them to eat meat. You see, God was preparing their appetite and their taste buds for the kind of food Adam ate in the Garden of Eden and the kind of food they would eat in the earth made new. Trust me, God is not going to have anybody in heaven complaining that there's no meat in heaven and there'll be no killing. God is not going to have anybody in heaven complaining that they can't find Chick-fil-A or Burger King or McDonald's. As a matter of fact, it was Satan who was encouraging the people that God's command against eating dead flesh amounted to cruel and unusual punishment. Look again at Numbers chapter 11 verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? Did you know that since the Garden of Eden, Satan's most successful temptations are the temptations that have to do with the appetite of man. Why? Because you see, Satan knows that intemperance in eating and drinking feeds the one thing that can draw us away from a life with God, and that one thing is our lust. You know, when I preached on curiosity, I shared that curiosity leads to experimentation, and experimentation leads to habit. Well, today I want you to see that when experimentation leads to habit, then habit becomes the outlet for the lust that live in our carnal flesh. Psalm 78, 18. And the children of Israel tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. You see, when our lusts are set on fire, we need all the mightiest powers in heaven to be able to resist the devil. The psalmist David records in Psalm 78, 18. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Yea, they even spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give bread too? Can he provide flesh for his people? Therefore the Lord heard this, the Bible says, and was angry. 
Friends, God was angry because what started as a small group with their unwarranted criticisms and their foolish complaining had now grown to a full-scale rebellion. They tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. Right now in America, we are a people who are lusting after dead flesh. You are hearing murmurings over a shortage of oil and a shortage of, uh, of other kinds of commodities, but I want you to know, if you want to see riots in the streets of America's cities, you let CNN report that there is a shortage of meat, of beef and chicken. While they were on the Lord's diet, the children of Israel noticed that not one in their midst had a cold or flu. Not one of their tribe had cancer or heart disease. The Bible tells us that, that was not a, there was not a feeble one in all their tribes. Now when I started out preparing this message, I began to see something about eating meat that I know we as a people no longer hear and no longer really want to be told. But did you know that when you eat meat, you plant often the seeds of disease in your body? Did you know that back in the early 1900s, the prevalence of cancers and tumors, they began to see that because people were living on dead flesh. Those who use flesh foods little know what they are eating. Often, they, if they only could see the animals when they were living and know the quality of the meat that they eat, they would turn from it with disgust and loathing. People are continually eating flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs. And in this way, fatal disease, diseases are communicated. Did you know that when brought to the place of slaughter, there are some animals who we're told they realize what is about to take place and they become maddened and furious and in this state, they are killed and their flesh prepared for market is really poisonous. Oh, I hear somebody say, I only eat fish. <laughs> well, I have an uncle who was a sea captain and he told me, if you saw what we dump in the ocean, he said, you'd never eat fish. In many places, especially when the fish comes in contact with the sewage of large cities, the fish becomes contaminated by the filth on which they feed and they become a cause of disease. The effects of a flesh diet may not be immediately realized because of the resilience of the human body, but there is no, this is no evidence that it is not harmful. Few can be made to believe what I'm sharing with you, that it is the meat that they've eaten that poisons them and causes suffering. My friends, poor Moses, poor Moses, here he was with the people screaming in revolt. We want meat, we want chicken, we want... Moses became so discouraged, he began to pray, Lord, wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? Lord, why are you putting me through this? Have I not found favor in thy sight? Lord, Lord why do you lay this burden on me? Where, where am I going to find enough flesh meat to feed this whole nation? Lord, they keep crying to me, Moses, we want our meat. Give us flesh. Lord, I can't bear it any longer. All right, said the Lord. Numbers 11, verse 18. Say thou unto the people, Sanctify thyselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. And Numbers 11, verse 19. Ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither 10 days, nor 20 days, but even a whole month until it, that meat, come out your nostrils and it be disgusting and loathsome unto you because that ye have despised the Lord which is among you and I have wept before him saying, why came ye forth out of Egypt? Well, we're told what happened. Suddenly, a strong wind started blowing from the sea and streaming overhead were flocks of quails. And by the way, that was their chicken. 
If we lived back then, it would have been Kentucky Fried Quail instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Numbers 11.31 says, And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were, a day's journey on this side, as it were, a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. All of a sudden, a whole lot of quail started falling out of the sky, dead on the ground. Now, the Bible tells us here that you could walk for a day in either direction and all you would see was dead birds, dead quail. Look at Numbers 11, verse 32. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. He that gathered least gathered ten homers. Now, a homer is between eight and ten bushels, and a bushel weighs 30 pounds. So the Bible is telling us here that he that gathered least gathered ten homers. He that gathered least gathered ten homers. That means that everybody was able to collect, get this, no less than 300 pounds pounds of quail. Each person gathered at least 300 pounds for themselves and what they could eat right away. They dried the, the rest so they could have enough to eat for the whole month. But that's a whole lot of meat for a month. God gave the people that which was not for their good because they persisted in crying out for it. Did you know that if you keep telling God what you want instead of listening to what he's saying and taking what he wants you to have, God will eventually give you what you want even if it's not best for you. Lord, I want this man as my husband. God will give you what you want even though it's not best for you. The children of Israel ate so much quail. The Bible says that large numbers of the people started coming down sick with terrible burning fevers and so many died that in Numbers chapter 11 verse 34 it says and he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava because there they buried the people that lusted. The other day I preached on curiosity and God showed me that curiosity leads to experimentation and experimentation leads to habit. Well, today I want you to see that when experimentation leads to habit, then what happens is habit becomes the outlet for the lust that are in our flesh. Remember in Psalm 78 verse 18 it says, and they tempted God in their hearts by asking meat for their lust. We often don't deal with the root causes of sin in our lives. We deal with the symptoms and the outbreaks. But here, Psalm 78, 18 is telling us they tempted God by asking meat for their lust. So it was really not so much about the meat, but about the lust. Lust is the deeper moral, spiritual issue. You see, there's something in our flesh that draws us away from the path God wants us to be on. And it is that drive we have within us to fulfill the cravings of the flesh. And that drive is called lust. The root cause that drives us to satisfy the desires of the flesh is lust. And he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava because there they buried the people that lusted. What is this thing called lust? What is this fever in our flesh called lust? Did you know that an addiction is what happens when you can no longer control the lust that are in your flesh on your own, when lust takes over, we call it an addiction. For we are then slaves to lust. We are ruled by lust. Lust has brought many a great man to ruin. Lust has destroyed many lives of great and noble women. Lust has destroyed churches. James 4, 1, from whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust that warn your members? I want you to know only the Lord can help you overcome the demon of lust. 
I heard of a man who told a story of shopping one day with his wife at the mall when a shapely young woman in a short, tight, form-fitting dress strolled by, swinging her hips. He said, as my eyes followed her, my wife, who was looking down at the price tag and saw everything while looking down at the price, head with her, price tag with her head down, she said, with all her radar going, as my eyes followed her, my wife, who saw the whole thing with her head down, without looking up, said, now was that worth all the trouble you're in now? <laughs> Even Solomon, who knew something about lust, wrote, do not lust in your heart after a woman's beauty, or let her captivate you with her eyes, for the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress preys upon your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he, the Bible says, who sleeps with another man's wife. For the next few moments, let's ask God to help us dig a little deeper as we try to understand how to control this thing that controls so many lives called lust. Lust is a desire to satisfy the cravings of our flesh in ways God does not approve. It's a desire to satisfy the cravings of our flesh in ways God has not blessed or sanctioned. It's a selfly satisfaction. It is a passion that has been directed and corrupted by the power of sin. Lust by its very nature is temporal. It has no lasting quality. It never satisfies. That's why you just can't get enough of whatever it is you're lusting after. When the Bible talks about our fleshly lust, it means our evil desires, our urges, our passions. Lust means to have a yearning for the things of the flesh. And everybody who's listening to me today has experienced lust in some form. For one person, it might be a yearning for chocolate, another cheesecake pulling at you. For some other, it's a habit of grasping and grabbing and what they want. Some have a lust for shopping. It's a craving, a hungering, a thirsting, a longing. Some people steal because of lust. Some people drink and smoke and do drugs because of lust. Everyone here knows what it's like to lust. Everyone on this planet. My lust may not be your lust and your lust may not be my lust, but we all understand intimately the concept. All of us intimately know how strong the flesh is and how difficult it is to control. And what are the lusts of the flesh? Most of us, when we think lust, what do we think of? We think sex, the sex drive can be, and I say can be, a manifestation of lust. We, we read about some of the lusts we deal with every day as Christians and as human beings. In Galatians 5.19, it says, now the works of the flesh are manifest. There are many Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, wrath, strife, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The works of the sinful human nature are well known. Sexual sins, impure thoughts, filthy language, debauchery, they also include idolatry, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, strife, hostility, heresies, drunkenness, perversions. There are other evils committed, which I'm, Paul says, I'm not going to mention. <laughs> you already know what they are, he said. Drunkenness, taking drugs to affect your senses, pleasure, tipsy, being intoxicated, reveling, taking part in wild parties drinking parties. You do that and you feed the lust of the flesh. In some shape or some form, every one of us has had to deal with the lust of the flesh. You ought to fight against it. You ought to ask God for the strength. Whether you overeat, whether you become angry, whether you're smoking, whether you're doing drugs, you're being selfish and you need to ask God for the strength to deal with the lust of the flesh, and he will give it to you. You can overcome 
if you give your heart to Christ. I'm Wentley Phipps. Go out and make your world a world of praise.